Well, it's been a long time uh, since I've uh, gotten updated or we've been updated on uh, the status of, of the theory of nuclear winter. Could you, could, could you bring us up to date on that? Well, nuclear winter is the predicted, uh, from, from physics calculations, uh, cooling and darkening of the Earth following a nuclear war. Basically what happens is uh, mainly from the burning of cities, fine particles get uh, put up into the atmosphere, block sunlight, and uh, so it gets darker and, and cooler. Uh, we uh, did, uh, a little more than five years ago, a set of calculations showing that the effect was horrendous even for a small nuclear war that the burning of a hundred downtowns uh, globally was enough to produce a hemispheric wide global uh, nuclear winter. And uh, there have been uh, a lot of debates on it because it has a set of very uh, disturbing uh, implications about the nuclear arms race. It challenges the fundamental ideas of, uh, of nuclear deterrence. Uh, and there's been a lot of fighting. What's happened now is that there's been a very nice convergence. Uh, some of the, uh, the prior claims that uh, it's only a nuclear autumn, it's not so bad, it's, it's not as bad as a nuclear winter, turn out to have occurred from uh, n everybody not putting the, the same smoke at the same altitudes. When everybody starts with the same starting conditions, you end up with the same very serious effects. So now that there's a convergence in the science, it's important to uh, understand what the policy implications are. One policy implication comes back to your question a minute ago about uh, how many nuclear weapons is enough, uh, is uh, the idea that if Nation A makes a massive attack for whatever reason on Nation B, Nation B doesn't do anything to defend itself or to retaliate. Nevertheless, the smoke that gets raised over Nation B circulates around the world, covers Nation A. Nation A gets cold and dark and the agriculture fails, and uh, Nation A has destroyed itself by launching a nuclear war on Nation B. The main consequence of, uh, of nuclear winter is uh, massive agricultural failures. and. Uh, Many international uh, study groups have now concluded that the, uh, the net result in mass starvation can account for many billions of lives. Well, there's only five billion. How many is many? Well, hard to quantify, but you're absolutely right. It's a big fraction of the human community, and that's the long-term effect. And the prompt effects, you know, you're going to kill many hundreds of millions, maybe one or two billion people, in the direct consequence of a nuclear war. So it now appears that... Uh, that nuclear war certainly will destroy the, the nations involved with the nuclear war, almost certainly will destroy the global civilization, and might just possibly destroy the human species. So that's another uh, calibration of how serious the stakes are these days, how high the stakes are, because of our technology. Nuclear war has put us in a position to do utter devastation to our species putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere promises, if that's the right word, uh, a global catastrophe, not just uh, destruction of, uh, of farmland, uh, flooding, some places drought, other places rise in sea level, inundation of coastal cities all over the planet. That's serious stuff. The depletion of the ozone layer uh, from uh, these chlorofluorocarbon compounds lets more ultraviolet light from the sun down to the surface of the earth. Skin cancer is a serious consequence. That's the one we hear mostly about, especially us light-skinned people. Uh, Dark-skinned people are much better protected against it. But the more serious aspect of it is that the ultraviolet light attacks the, the little one-celled plants that are at the base of the food chain. You know, those are the guys that the next guys eat, and the next guys, the next guys. Eat. And way up at the top of that ecological pyramid, there's us. And we're ultimately eating the one-celled plants that have been processed through lots of intermediate uh, plants and animals. And uh, so again, we're messing around with uh, the global environment in a very serious, very stupid way. And uh, we just have to get our technology in hand. It's not enough to say that, uh, that uh, corporations can do whatever they want as long as they make a profit. Not if they're putting at risk people all over the world. They can't. There has to be a new way of approaching this. And we can't say that one nation can do what it wants within its borders. Because, as I said before, what you do in one country's borders has consequences all over the planet. Well, we're going to probably be talking about space exploration, too. And uh, 
not just all gloom and doom, but while we're on the subject, <laughs> what can the average person, I mean, that, I think a lot of average people have heard a lot about this as the environmental and nuclear threat have been pounded in and pounded in, and we're, CNN continue to uh, raise the, the alarm cry, but what can the average uh, what can the average citizen do about it? Uh, because that's really, uh, a sense of hopelessness is not something that uh, you want to convey or that I want to convey. What can the average citizen do to affect changes on the part of, uh, of our government to, 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 to make the moves that are necessary? See, I don't think it's hopeless uh, at all. As I said before, uh, humans are good at figuring stuff out, and we're good at change. We've had a lot of changes. What can the viewers of this program do to make a difference in correcting these problems? They can make sure that candidates who don't understand and aren't deeply committed to ending and reversing the nuclear arms race, to stopping greenhouse warming, and to uh, stopping the depletion of the ozonosphere, that those guys aren't, men and women, are not elected. It's not enough to have a candidate say, I'm an environmentalist. In what way are you an environmentalist, Mr. or Ms. Candidate? Take a look at the, the most recent election. Uh, there we had a candidate who uh, said that he was an environmentalist. He, in contrast to the previous eight years, where we had an uncompromising anti-environmentalist in the White House. Okay, now there's a president, Mr. Bush, who at least acknowledges that there's a problem. We didn't even know that from, from listening to Mr. Reagan. But if you look at Mr. Bush's budget, we see not a hint of any real commitment to the environment. So I, I say, in a democracy, that's, that's the most important thing a person can do. There are a lot of other things a person can do. You can plant trees. Every individual can plant trees. That's something that's very constructive. You can boycott industries which are irresponsible on global warming and on chlorofluorocarbons. There are many things people can do, but they have to understand the issue before they can do those things. Well, we just had an election. We won't have another one for a couple of years. Uh, do you do you have uh, any faith in, in writing letters to your congressmen and, and senators? A lot of people believe that that has some effect. Uh, I think that it can have some effect. Uh, there's a multiplier effect because so few people do write. Those who do, the right. congressional staff says, hey, there must be 10 or 100 times as many people who agree with this letter but who haven't written to us. So that's, that's important, but, uh, but that's not nearly enough. People have to inform themselves. They have to understand these issues, and this then relates to the whole problem of, uh, of Americans not understanding science, not understanding mathematics, not being able to read, not know geography. I mean, we're in very bad trouble if we don't understand the planet we're trying to save.